So I, I titled this talk as Research to Body and Art to Inquiry because, um, because um, uh, like, uh, increasingly there are um, some um, art practices that's, that's based in or that's like, happening in the context of academia and research institutions. So this idea of doing research through art that, um, and, and to be able to like articulation of that activity becomes uh, quite important because any can, any, anything can be art, right? I'm, I believe in that anybody can be an artist, any, anybody can be a researcher. Like, even if you're, when you are, uh, when you want to buy a pair of sneakers, you have to do research, right? But uh, we are not talking about that here. So, um, so I want to kind of like provide a um, like simple framework for, like, um, Defining it um, without causing too many too much confusion, but uh, with the focus of my own practice. So, um, so this is a project that I done I've done uh, several years ago, um, which <coughs> looks like uh, as it is. Um, what does it look like? A book. A book. Yeah. And very boring looking book. Not really. Yeah. Quite elegant, actually. Oh, yeah? <laughs> I like that picture. Mm -hmm. So I was just following all the protocols for like government um, documents uh -huh. Uh -huh. Like, in the archive and everything. And um, there's a title, record, and there's a date, which is 2012, uh, September 28. And the meaning of this <coughs> will be kind of unfolded as you open the book. And this is what you see uh, when you just open a random spread uh, in the book. Is it, is it feasible enough for you? So can anybody tell me uh, what you can see here? What kind of information? They can't read it. Huh? I can't read it. You can't read it. <laughs> can I read it or you guys can read it? So uh, this thing here, the, the text in bold is saying loaded 1953 and 1964 Vietnam Korean War era authentic US military cannon, AMMO box. Price US dollar $22. Item location Portland, Oregon, VS. Item number 290777969468. And there's this image. And the text, following text, which is kind of like really broken and partial. Authentic cartridge crate, side markings, loaded 11 to 53, updated 1964. H-E-O-R, which means Hermiston, Oregon, perhaps. Ammunition for explosive projectiles, 481 mm cannon from 1953 and 1964, and the text goes on. And uh, like the other items are speaking about <coughs> other items. Uh, and uh, what do you think this uh, this information? Where do you think this information is coming from? Sales catalog or hmm? a sales or auction catalog? Sales auction catalog. catalog. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Collection. Collection. Record. Record. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think these are all very, very correct and valid answers. And the specific uh, uh, corpus uh, of information that I got this information from is eBay.com actually. So I um, I downloaded. I I mean no. I I searched, it was a really random, like I searched with the keyword Korean War on eBay.com one day. And then the search results kind of shocked me because there were like almost like 10,000 items at the time uh, that was being sold and exchanged on eBay.com. And um, as, a, as someone who's from South Korea, uh, that was very uh, surprising because um, the like associating the the idea of Korean War and commerce was something that that was really unthinkable for me. So um, because that that 
event was very um, tragic and uh, still remains as an un, like, unsolved um, conflict. It's, we are still like in the middle of war. It, the war never has been ended there. So um, that's kind of like why I was uh, interested in making this book. Because also another aspect is that all the information on on the uh, platform is very ephemeral. It, it's it's never the same. Like whenever you, like every day basically or every hour, it changes its content. So um, I wanted to kind of crystallize my uh, experience of um, putting this research keyword, I mean like search keyword there. <coughs> so um, I downloaded. I mean I did, like. Obviously, wrote a code, but wrote a code for downloading everything what was available at the time, and then, and then reclassify, like had to make classification of the information, different kind of information it contains, and then, and then kind of like reorder it in a different form system of organizing the information. And this um, archival form is very very rigid, and it's just static, and it will just like lost. So. That was my idea, a very simple idea behind this project. And also another thing that I realized I could do with this information is to, is to extract some meaningful um, words and languages that were being used in, in this um, com commercial activity. So, so I used the um, um, statistics uh, uh, technique for that are that was used by uh, marketers, and that technique was to like uh, was for um, discerning words that had either negative or positive meanings in marketability. So um, these are the words uh, from the description of the all these items, and um, yeah, some of them are tough, traceable, tragic, transparent, trendy, tricky, troubled. Unable, unannounced, unchanged, um, unsolvable, unused, unwanted, unwilling, upgraded, upset, usable, useful, useless, use your usual. So those were the uh, words that I could extract from the all the all the text, and then that was also included as um, as part of the book at the end of the book, so that the readers can uh, find the items with this kind of quality. Um, and another thing that I realized was that um, it could actually be expanded in a larger, as a larger project, um, because primarily because Korean War. I really the Korean War is also one of the wars that the U.S. Uh, was involved in. So I looked it up uh, online about the uh, all the. Um, all the wars, names of the wars that U.S. Ha was um, involved in in the past, and then did all the search um, research on eBay, and then and then downloaded all the information about all the wars that uh, was related to the U.S. Particip participation. But just the making making of this book was so treasury, so I didn't really like go for making the actual books with this data, but I still have the data. But and I'm sure that the data, there are probably like there are more volumes uh, now, uh, by now, because it was done uh, four or five years ago. But anyway, this is a simulation of what it could be like uh, if I change the frame, the frame of this um, project. So, um, so the, the question, the question, I had a question when I started this project which was about, first, I, like, my motivation was that I wanted to understand why I was so shocked by this encounter with this information, right? Which obviously uh, was related to the, the background and the context and my own identity. But another thing that I was also interested in was how, I mean, this information, raw information and data has its own uh, vitality, its own like energy, but um, it changes uh, depending on how we organize it, how the kind of the system, the form of the system we use upon those data. So uh, how can a different form of system can change the meaning of the uh, data? That was also my, 
um, question. So, so I'm kind of like explaining uh, uh, this process because I, I think uh, having a question in the beginning is a very, very important uh, process for doing artist research. And my other works, these are all like from a very long time ago, and especially these are the examples that I've, that I've done when I was a student at MIT here, uh, downstairs. So I did uh, all the, I tried to make, I tried to start with a question whenever I start a project. So this has, this kind of, like this performance piece had this question about the, the modern model of medicine. And um, this was, this project was questioning uh, ergonomic design um, and whether it really, like what it does to human well-being actually. It, wouldn't it actually kind of uh, put us into a prison of labor or, or would it just uh, liberate us from um, a hazard and risk of uh, like sitting for too long? And this was about uh, anxiety related to climate crisis uh, because of uh, the geological time, the, the scale of it and the, the anxiety of human beings side uh, that seems so far away and very, very uh, absurd. Another thing. So uh, in this <clears throat> talk, uh, I'm going to kind of focus on those three uh, uh, pillars, uh, which is about, which are about what is artist research, uh, like how can we define it, and how can we conduct and conduct it and present it, present this kind of research um, through art, and why does it matter, and what what are the challenges, and the two first uh, questions are kind of like intertwined with each other, so I'll just uh, put it in the same uh, cluster. Um, one useful, um, can you read it clearly? Is it, yes. is it clear? Um, one useful classification uh, to think about the research activities around art, um, in my opinion, would be this. Um, there are, and this is not from my own uh, finding, this is, um, I'm quoting from this artist named uh, Florian Dumbois, who um, was very active in, um, artistic research uh, uh, realm in Europe. Um, but um, still, this class of nothing is like has been settled and nothing is really canonized yet. But um, I, I find this very useful when we're thinking about what research, um, artistic research means. So there are, to, to put it simplistically, uh, there are three kinds of research activities around art. The first one, which is research on art, would be uh, literally research on art. It's, um, it can be a art history, it can be an art theory, or it can be a like, criticism of art, or it can be a study of um, um, art market or curation and whatnot, those kind of things. And research for art um, can be the research that's, that's for, that is being done for realizing art, a certain kind of art project. So this um, example in the center is called um, Peck and Abe video synthesizer, uh, which was developed in 1972. So uh, when Nam Jun Peck, who is considered the pioneer of a video artist, um, well, in his time, uh, there was no like authoring tool, right? I mean, there is a video, um, like Porta Peck kind of like video recording device and television monitors, but there was no real, um, authoring tools, so um, he had to develop his own uh, tool uh, so that he can realize what he, he was envision, envisioning with the, uh, with the, with the um, script-based art at the time. So it was also patented. I, I think it's also possible that he, he developed it when he was at MIT. He, was, he did a two years residency here around the time. And the last example, which I want to focus on now, is research through art. This is uh, this means uh, research uh, that's being uh, that is conducted through art and that is also communicated through art. And I'm uh, I'm uh, I brought this example of uh, one installation art here, um, which will be introduced very soon again. 
And there are another useful classification for thinking about research, <coughs> like relationship between research and art. Um, I think uh, research text is <coughs> one uh, very um, textual language of one um, uh, important means for uh, conducting and communicating research activities now these days. And also numeric language is also a big part of the research. But I'm uh, when I'm talking about research through art, I'm we're not like adding artistic language to that, right? So it's about language issue as well. So, uh, and another person also mentioned the research in and through art, but I will only um, focus on the through part. And this person uh, was defining research through art as in terms of like intent and originality and like whether it produces knowledge and understanding, whether it has questions, issues, problems, context, methods, documentation, and dissemination. But I thought it was uh, very, very, um, uh, it wasn't very like, uh, it didn't, like all this elements does, does not have very clear role in his argument. Especially when, um, because these are very, very um, methodical and prescriptive. But um, art as a practice and also the history of contemporary art or since modern art has been like this. Basically, when you want to make a original and meaningful art, then it has to deal with this problem of what is art, and you have to challenge the the pre-existing pre notion of art as well. So um, those methods, or like any form of like uh, conventional forms, wouldn't uh, really fit in defining any kind of like artistic activity. So um, to sum. Uh, research through art, I define uh, with um, research through art as the um, activity, artistic and research activity that, that's driven by question. And it has to be conducted and communicated through senses rather than um, textual language or numeric language. And Sorry, did you say senses? Mm -hmm, sense. So I think uh, when um, when we're thinking about different kinds of language doing uh, uh, for conducting research, I think what can distinguish art the most from other forms of language is easy capacity to use senses and it's embodied, uh, embodied, and using your own sensory um, organs uh, to perceive it too. So it's intuitive as well. Intuitive and gut feeling, everything included. So, and also method methodologically, it has to be plural because um, other than uh, the emphasis on like the use of the senses and embracing it, um, it cannot really be um, uh, defined. Um, so I'm going back to the this uh, installation piece, uh, which was uh, done by uh, an artist called Christoph Ludisko uh, almost ten years ago. And it was at, um, presented, first presented as at Venice Biennale in um, 2009. And uh, when, and I'm sure that he wouldn't call it a research or he, he, he made it as a research, but I, I think um, this project uh, has all the uh, quality as an artist research. So this is, a, I'm going to be showing you a very candid video uh, by, um, an audience, random audience at the. Who are? So, <laughs> no, this is not. Um, how do I go back? Well, is a video? Yeah, this is a video, and uh, I think I need to see my. Is it? Huh? Is it? The video is not not linked. It's you can just go out of this and go to YouTube, mm -hmm. the link. Where is my... I want to... Oh, here it is. It will work.
so um, is anybody familiar with this work? Yes. Yeah. And um, huh? and the title of this work is Guest. Um, and I, can I ask you what you just saw here? What you what you felt? What did you feel, or what do you think the question behind this project would be? <clears throat> Who are these people? Who are these people? Mm -hmm. What are they doing? Huh? And what are they doing? What What are they doing? Uh -huh. And there's some. There's this surface tension between their presence and my presence mm -hmm, in the space. Mm -hmm. How much can you communicate through body, from, you know, body, body, mm -hmm. actually, what mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. communication? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what I think uh, the tension between the, the shadows and the audience is also very, very, mm -hmm. and also bodily relationship, relationship is very important in this work. And uh, to give more information, those images were all um, projections. So uh, productions uh, projected from the from the back, um, and do you see uh, what these shadows are doing behind the screen? Well, lots of different things, right? One's sweeping leaves, mm -hmm. one some are coming down as if they're on a rope. Others are looks like someone's being. Mm -hmm. Skippo Airport has someone who's changing the time every minute. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're, yeah. Yeah. Working. working. Yeah, working. So I think uh, all of these are very, very valid observations, and that, that are all, these are all related to the questions, specific questions this um, artist was making at the time. So I'm going to go into that. Who are Europeans? Who are you? Who are Europeans? Uh -huh. Who is a stranger? Who is a guest? This is the title of the show. Perhaps we are the guests to the country that we thought is ours and that we actually understand as ours, in which we feel at home. But perhaps we actually should learn and be maybe somehow welcome by the hosts who are working, taking care of our children, of our parents, grandparents, who clean our apartments, who cook for us, without whom we would be dead. <laughs> about 80% of large population of people from Vietnam who live in Poland without documents, for example. Very large number of people from Chechnya who wait endlessly for refugee status, sometimes in transitional camps or in refugee centers. Um, so that's, uh, that's the, 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 what we see through those foggy windows that come from Poland. And then there are people who came from Romania, from Pakistan, uh, from Ukraine, uh, from other places in uh, Italy, who also are on the other side of those uh, imaginary windows. Also, uh, there are people who are uh, the fourth generation of uh, residents of Italy who still have no working papers and uh, permanent resident status. Uh, um, Gypsies, uh, people of Roma. The 
this is the situation of many of us who work in offices or in our galleries. And suddenly there is somebody there on the other side imprinted. Uh, who is that person? Most likely it's a it's undocumented worker who is maybe cleaning this those windows and standing on scaffolding as if he was actually invading our space. Of course he's not invading our space. We feel invaded by that person. So the fear comes with that foggy image. At the same time, something else comes, the realization that we know nothing about. So if that foggy image is uh, uh, pierced through by things they say, those shadows, to each other, not knowing that we are listening, the honesty and truth of their existential condition will come through. At the same time, they will be protected from our gaze or from our attempt to identify <coughs> them with their situation. Because we cannot even imagine that we really understand their situation. But we should at least realize that, that their situation is unimaginable, impossible to comprehend by us. Yet it's definitely unacceptable situation. So why not recognize this emotionally, intellectually, but emotionally even more, more and first, before we continue our sophisticated political theory you know, based conversations, how we resolve this problem globally and deal with free trade and change conditions in poor countries so people not come here and so forth and so on. Yes, this is important. But meantime, those people are here. They are us, they are our country, our Europe. Of course, similar issue can be addressed in the United States. It should be. And I have addressed this in my previous work. Um, and at the same time, addressing these issues is easier in the United States because it's an immigrant country. <laughs> Europe is only learning now how to recognize itself as <laughs> Europe of strangers. I, I, I was trying to finish this uh, video clip because um, what he says um, has contained so many uh, elements of research in it, but at the same time, it was a better documentation than the candid one. But I want to point out that uh, this is a, this is a, uh, this would, like in my framework, this would work as a research, like artist research and research through art perfectly. But um, like if you look at the, the, um, um, the like um, the process that he he explained and also the form uh, it it has all different kinds of research activities around art from like research on art he has to understand the the contemporary landscape of art activities and and the political relationship between between different kinds and different themes that um, the art is um, art project is operating in. And secondly, it is also there is a component research for art as well because he uh, he had to devise the projection uh, uh, technique for for this specific piece, and also he had to um, these were all the shadows are the real uh, people, real immig undocumented uh, immigrants, and he had to identify those people and then listen to what they're real concerns are there, what their fears are, what their hopes are. 
So there was a lot of like research for art components in the process, but at the end, uh, he delivered it through the experience, through like embodied experience and through a very, um, very emotional meaning. Um, he was talking about it is both emotional, um, like in, like input, but it's also very intellectual input, right? But um, he was kind of emphasizing on the um, emotion that has come first before we talk about political theory. But anyway, um, that was um, the first project example. And the second one, um, which is um, which is about olfactory senses. Um, um, there is a um, German artist called Cecil Tolas um, who is, has been working on this project for a long time. It's, I think this text was actually from, um, no, this is not her own text. This is, um, she, like she's quoting someone else, but um, she has been working on this project since the beginning of the 2000. Um, and um, she was trying to like literally make uh, an alphabet for the nose at the time. So um, this is what she uh, did um, as a research for her art activity. So um, she was collecting like many, many different kinds of smell all over the world. And then, um, and then he, she uh, kind of tried to make a vocabulary out of that. So um, I can read you uh, some example. I'm not sure about uh, how to pro actually pronounce this, uh, these words. These are like the Roman alphabet, but um, she's German and I'm not sure like what kind of sound, phonetic sound she's envisioning with this <coughs> word, but um, there's a smell, name of a smell called Chepdu which means chip furniture storage. <laughs> Casca, sweat mixed with metal of cars. Dado, dead leaves and compost. Dokasa, kebab and perfumes. Fre, wet and rainy street after a Sunday. Fibish, grilled fish. Freeze, leisure. Fig, bird. Guhish, bulldogs and other dogs. Glush, Bentley, Rolls Royce. Dra, hot fat meat. Kisses, horse. Hifi, wheat, beer. Hozon, countryside. So these are, these kind of sound like, um, you know, like um, Chinese encyclopedia. So the classification is very, uh, it's not, it, it doesn't fit into uh, what we use, the kind of the classification system we use uh, for other, um, um, for other things, but the, this is what she felt uh, that's kind of like, as one category, um, like the casa kebab and perfumes, that's, that has to work as, as one entity for her. So this is like uh, the logic behind uh, her like uh, construction of the vocabulary around the <clears throat> smell and olfactory senses. And what it also what it, she also did was to make a map of the smell. So this is a map of Berlin, uh, and she created like uh, alternative kind of map, uh, depend like totally based on her own system. And uh, how could it kind of? Um, uh, communicated uh, to a larger audience or, or, or to a very specific art audience. So her exhibition looks like this. Um, the, she worked with um, you know, uh, molecular engineers and then she, she could kind of like, she could isolate all, all the, all the um, smell and then kind of reproduce uh, the the liquid that would um, mimic the smell. So it was basically, um, her paint was spray, like, like transparent spray, and she would just um, install the smell using her spray, and then that would, that would be the exhibition. 
and the audience had to kind of just uh, snip it, snip the wall. And um, there is, um, it's not even visible on this image, but there is a very, very tiny numbers uh, on each smell. And that's, uh, that's, re that's a reference to uh, another, the other object on the other side of the room, which was a documented book of uh, a smell. And it explains like what the smell number 15 uh, was called and what that smell is from, where the smell is from. So, um, and this is her archive of uh, her, her, <laughs> her vocabulary. This is, um, there is a, like, it says it was like 2016, uh, from 2016, she already has seven, uh, more than 7,000 different kinds of uh, recreated smells and the, all the smells were classified and bottled and with uh, her own label. Um, uh, with her own vocabulary for each smell. And this is another example that can be an artistic research as well. This is more, I don't know, formally I find it kind of like more conventional and not very interesting. But um, this specific project is um, trying to convey some sort of like archives uh, that will speak about uh, something which is about the development of the modern medicine and like specifically plastic surgery around the World War I era. And uh, these are the archival images uh, on the left side. And he was uh, specifically looking at trying to uh, kind of reveal the relationship between this uh, emergence of this kind of very various technique and uh, and the colonization process in the North Africa at the time. So, so the the object on the right side is uh, the local like form of a very specific uh, tribe that was uh, living in um, some part of Morocco, and um, and these sculptures, uh, wooden sculptures, are what the artist asked those um, people who are the the. The current resident in the area who who were inherited with the culture there, local culture there, so they were recreating this image with their own method there. So in a way to kind of remember, uh, have a means to uh, remember historical event on their own. So this is an archival form, but still, which is very very spatial, and um, you have to navigate through all kinds of like very tactile. Uh, information. So um, these are the examples uh, that I prepared today. So, and I want to lastly talk about the challenges uh, in pursuing this kind of approach, especially in the current moment. The first point I want to address is the platform. I was mostly mentioning the sculpture and installation. I mean, the, the, the Venice Biennale example is, um, can be a very, uh, one good example of virtual reality as well. It's a very spatial installation where you are very, very immersed in. But, um, but um, and my project also deals with, um, kind of was using, addressing some liquid kind of media as well, but uh, it was also at the end, it was a sculpture form. But um, if uh, there are some new platforms that's, um, that's potentially, uh, kind of, that are being experimented these days. These, this project, specific project, um, made by artist Jonas Lund, is called Jonas Lund Token. And uh, Jonas Lund Token 1041. And he, he's this is just a, um, you know, laser cut piece of wood uh, panel with the information. But uh, his actual work doesn't happen here. It, his actual work happens on, on a blockchain network. So he created his own uh, cryptocurrency and then based on Ethereum. Uh, and um, he was distributing 10,000 tokens to the stakeholders <laughs> of his project. And this piece of wood, uh, which you can purchase, uh, which which you can buy from could buy from this artist contains the 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 information for this is uh, the hashtag for 
for the currency. So if you buy this piece of wood, then you would have the ownership of the, the cryptocurrency, one unit of uh, currency uh, in his platform, in his system. So, um, so uh, with like um, the people, everybody, like everyone who could make purchase of this piece of wood has this um, right to make decisions on his artistic practice. So he was also kind of like, um, he was kind of, he was um, utilizing the kind of democratic process of agreement that can happen on the blockchain network. But he was at the same time also questioning the, the um, authorship and um, of artists and agency of artists in, in the creative uh, activities here. But uh, this is like uh, one of the very, very rare examples uh, where artist was actively uh, making creative work on blockchain network, on a new platform. And in terms of platform, there's another aspect of um, uh, um, yeah, this is a platform. I was also wondering about the platform for exchanging art rather than just conventional form of exhibitions. So there are uh, some uh, experimental forms of communicating and exchanging artistic practice and then and then kind of uh, um, it's not grading um, reviewing each other's pieces uh, um, like as an artist as a group of artists just like a peer review process but um, these are mostly on a web uh, platform so it has uh, all the limitation that any web-based uh, system has so um, it's not very physical, it's not when, especially, which is very, very crucial when uh, artistic project tends to be, and it has a greater meaning when it delivers uh, emotion or information through senses and bodily experience. And the second challenge is, um, is uh, to find a way to uh, alternative modes of ex like experience augmentation. So we have our current uh, techniques for doing that. And this is a one very ancient um, example of using quasi-VR um, uh, technique. So it was from, this is a work called Becoming Real by artist Misha Cardenas. And this project was from 2010, uh, which was when um, we had a sort of um, headset uh, technology ready at the time but we didn't really have the uh, authoring tool for um, uh, creators at the time so she was just using the headset and the second life uh, environment at the time but um, we, we can easily kind of make a draw a direct connection with the current uh, form of VR um, application but uh, and you can see that uh, she was trying very much to augment um, physical experience onto this, um, uh, into the um, technology uh, that was um, only addressing probably the auditory information and visual information. So um, I think that's, that is still one challenge uh, at the time. Um, and the same artist, I'm just like giving um, like, chronology of uh, one artist example to, to give you a clear um, trajectory. So she made, this is like a couple of years later than uh, this uh, very limited VR um, um, performance. She made a um, wearable, this is a, this is a wearable, she was using wearable, um, wearable technology for, um, for, again, immigrants and guests and aliens uh, in public space. And that cloth will, clothes will specific, uh, dress will give you uh, some uh, stimuli when you're confronted with uh, potentially dangerous people for you or potentially uh, like people uh, in the same um, shoes with you. So that will alert you, but at the same time that will like pr protect you from uh, from a uh, potential hazard in public. And she made a performance piece, dance piece, uh, using this um, um, dress she, de she developed. 
And this is her um, project from two years ago, which is an augmented reality piece. And um, this is for, she was um, trying to bring in the experience of crossing borders. So um, again, she was trying to kind of like, um, uh, um, this is not super uh, physical, unlike this example or that, that example, but um, she was trying to kind of like create this spatial um, exper experience of, uh, of, the pers of the people who are crossing the border um, and uh, kind of create the empathy uh, using her uh, environment, creative environment. But uh, still, uh, what we can do is very, very limited in terms of uh, tactility and uh, physicality. Basically, the physical, physical augmentation experience is very, very limited these days. Although, uh, but I can, we can kind of um, see the, we can, we can already sense the possibility from the biomechatronics approaches uh, happening here and there. But um, I will give you some really, um, again, very old, very kind of like simple example of how uh, using those biomechatronics uh, approach can be critical and uh, can kind of address a question. So this is a very, this is a very small video. The electrode actuated human mechatronic research project seeks to power human locomotion entirely through low-cost electronics and without the use of an exoskeleton. In this revision of the system, a new feedback method is being tested. Sensors within the subject's clothing dynamically update muscle actuators, creating a fluid human robotic system that adapts to unpredictable external events. The electrode actuated human mechatronics research project seeks to power human locomotion entirely through electronic means without the use of an exoskeleton. A Bluetooth interface receives control signals from an iPhone app, activating electrodes across the subject's leg muscles. Here we see a low voltage startup of the system. Seven sequential signals are sent from the iPhone app to calibrate the actuator. Initial tests of the system were used to revise the inverse kinematic feedback algorithms, eventually producing a walking motion entirely driven by electrode impulses. Here we see the system in action after several weeks of revision. So this was an um, artist artist project, um, and uh, he was definitely mimicking something uh, like uh, that's the, the kind of research uh, that's happening at the media lab, but. Um, and all the uh, actuators uh, situation here are fake, but he was trying to kind of mimic it uh, to to kind of like one is to to kind of like um, demonstrate how this can be used as a performance. But secondly, uh, he was doing this to kind of uh, addressing his uh, like uh, like um, deliver his critical view about the current that like it was also. 10 years ago, but uh, uh, the, the need for critical um, reflection on the robotic uh, research uh, that was happening at the time, like through Boston Dynamics <coughs> and so on. So I think um, uh, physical <coughs> augmentation is probably the, the most um, challenging um, like void uh, uh, when it comes to uh, making um, artistic research um, really meaningful and powerful because if we can do that if we can do that then the, the the challenge of platform can be challenged as well 
if you can deliver the experience um, like uh, through as a data and then if you if you can just um, experience it like elsewhere it can be a tele uh, exhibition and tele performance which is not like unprecedented either but um, with a um, more reliable and trust uh, reliable exoskeletal or sensor-based actuator um, can um, deliver the artistic experience to the audience as well. And the personal experience. Uh -oh. And also pedagogy. But um, I am teaching a course called Artistic Research Workshop at Harvard University currently. And then the challenges that I'm that I'm experiencing there is very, very different from like what I've been explaining uh, this this afternoon because uh, the student student body in the research institutions like M MIT or Harvard, um, if you think about the demography of it, um, there are so little artists, and there are a lot more researchers, uh, like properly trained researchers from coming from all kinds of different fields. So uh, often, uh, my class for teaching um, artists to approach their art making in, with a framework of making a research becomes a, a class for intro, introduction to visual art class for advanced researchers. So which are very, very different kinds of activities. So that's, but, uh, but I do see that like these uh, like diverse group of people like who can be from art, who can be from other fields like anthropology or um, mechanical engineering or government or design school, uh, when they're when they're like studying and um, creating the same place, they can they actually they they can have very very beneficial environment, but the challenge is for an instructor uh, to to really kind of uh, offer them pr uh, prepare for them um, the environment that can be both meaningful to both group of people. So yeah, that was that was it. Um, I started with this image, so I'll just let it up. But uh, thank you for listening so far. And uh, any comments or questions so far? So before before you spoke, there was a, we had a previous speaker from Harvard this morning mm -hmm. um, who's doing work on documenting graffiti and documenting shifts, mm -hmm. visions of future and fashion, and um, trying to figure out how to make critical statements mm -hmm. uh, with, with that work. Mm -hmm. And it, in a certain way, it required sort of stepping outside the box and talking about it. I mean, one, one way is to try to do it with the materials you have, the, the formal materials you have. A problem I see with a lot of this work, or an issue, not a problem, an issue. Um, as formal, one can look at these as formal systems, uh, we just goes work with the images. One can look at that as a purely formal installation, mm -hmm. and the, the word immigrant would never come up. Mm -hmm. In fact, I mean, a lot of other things could come. So, so I guess the challenge this morning, and I, I feel it a little bit mm -hmm. here, is in a research endeavor where you're trying to understand more, you're trying mm -hmm. to use these these instruments to to gain a kind of insight, whether through practice or through you know, understanding the role of practice, place of practice in the world. How does, how does that, does it require stepping outside the box? You've done that, Yudishko did it, gave us a great explication, you've given us a great explication, it makes a lot of sense. But what happens when you confront the work? Without, the, where does the frame come from? Mm -hmm. I guess that's my question, yeah. simple question. I think the more powerful, the most powerful tool for framing is actually the title of the work. And he, uh, his project was titled as Guest, and um, which is not uh, 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 accurate, very accurate to the, the actual like, subject matter he was dealing with. But that has to be kind of um, um, understood in the context of the exhibition and context of the time, time um, um, temporal and spatial like, context of the work was presented. So it was, particularly it was um, in 2009 in Venice Biennale. Uh, and it's very true, you may speak more clearly to uh, like people who already have like literacy in the art world. But the Venice Biennale tends to be um, a site of um, very political conflict. 
it's 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 like Olympics for artists, right? And the uh, and the uh, there is a national pav a set of national pavilions, um, but there are only and there is a general like bigger exhibition site, but the there are only thirty six national pavilions official one when we have like two hundred kind of like states on the planet. So like who to include and who to not like who not to that's already very very political. But at, at the same time, when someone is selected to represent their state's um, pavilion, then it becomes also a very, very political problem. So when <coughs> Vlisigo was um, representing a Polish pavilion at the time, um, he kind of wanted to, and it was very, very Eurocentric site as well. So um, he was addressing uh, what was very clearly happening at the time, and it was also before, uh, before everything we know, we now know of like Occupy and the rise of the extreme right wing and Macron and the Trump and everything. So, um, so and it was a time when we're I think the problem when the problem was less complicated than now, than the question the, the problems we have now. So. Um, but, but at the same time, people weren't very uh, informed of the existing problem. And um, he was also explaining that uh, the awareness of that was very, very a lot weaker in Europe than in the US at the time. So I think um, he was also like playing with this specific context and, 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 and giving the, by offering the right title to the work, um, that's, kind of, that's kind of the frame and lens to look at the work. So just to carry that one step, mm -hmm. So we, we, you were careful to sort of locate this at a time before a lot of the polarization mm -hmm. we're experiencing. And we know with some of that polarization that people, that the very same objects, the very same experiences can provoke radically different mm -hmm. interpretive stances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So where are we today with the, with the minimally framed or the unsubtly framed mm -hmm. uh, work? Mm -hmm. Do, is there still a place for that or how can we does it take a explicature to, mm -hmm. to make this stuff work? I think it's um it's about walking um on the fine line between different uh, perceptions and uh, opinions about the same thing. So um for example, um um you know, to be honest, I don't I couldn't find a really good example uh, nowadays. And I think artists are very, very fatigued with the, the complications of uh, all the problems we are having, because uh, like uh, we can't really confidently say that what you are saying and what you are perceiving is wrong, right? So, um, and we want to be careful, and and we know that like just denouncing a certain group of people wouldn't help us either. So, uh, but um, I think uh, artists are in general really good at like um, trained to, to walk on a fine line between the realm of the aesthetic, the realm of politics and the realm of whatever. So they can be kind of ambivalent about those things when they are kind of, like, kind of creating an environment for experience. So, um, and I think like all of those works that I've uh, exemplified today uh, has those ambivalence. Um, for example, like this, uh, this example it was kind of embracing and celebrating what a blockchain network can do, but at the same time was kind of criticizing uh, the, 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 what it implies in terms of like the current whole humanities we have at the time. Do we have to change the humanities or, or is it just bad for our humanity? Um, so I think um, artists, uh, one like strong strategy that artists like to use uh, when they're uh, doing their um, research is to to be able to maintain the ambivalent have the room for ambivalence in the in the communication. Just like can I just like one comment about the because I think the question raised up about the, the digital translation. I think that that kind of points to uh, an issue that often exists with these kind of public interventions, which is a lot of the discussions about them happen kind of through third or fourth party documentation and, and a lot get lost in the translation. Because I think, in fact, Lubitschko is one of the best examples of artists that do uh, show rather than tell. And you actually 
if you actually experience these installations right in person, they're very they're not very ambivalent. I mean, because he often includes, especially in the last couple of decades where he's been working with projections, uh, with uh, video projections, they usually almost always include audio and often video of the people themselves telling you their stories. And that, that that's very immediate, you know, and that provokes a very human reaction. Like, that's one installation I'm not sure about. Maybe you know, but like, if I think even there, and he was talking to that, in the installation, you can actually hear the people telling some of their, and you oh. just can't see it in documentation. But that's a key part, right? That's oh. what makes it human, right? The, because you can walk around and you're hearing people through the windows talking. And, and um, but in most of his pieces, it's a lot more overt. It's very much in your face. Like he's doing a project now that. I advise the really early part of, but it, it involves drones that kind of, uh, he did one in Italy and now he's doing one in Governor's Island this summer, where they're actually kind of invading. The drones are kind of, mm -hmm. uh, have the eyes and the mouths of immigrants from the local community that are kind of invading the local space and speaking their narrative. So, so it's very much kind of contained in the work. Mm -hmm. Should we look at the example? That's actually really mm -hmm. exciting. Uh, it's called Lore. Yeah, you yeah. Can look it up. Yeah, I was kind of like contemplating whether to include that work or not. But, oh, where's my cursor? Well, I can't find it. It's on the bottom. Let's just move on to the next question, sorry. Could I address this question yeah, sure, of, sure, sure, of sure. do you have to step outside of the frame? I think it's very interesting. Um, I don't know anything about artistic dis uh, research, but as a design research, we actually have approaches that allow us to uh, pursue a first person perspective. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to just frame it that way. <clears throat> or the second person perspective, which is a more em empathic way or empathic design. Mm -hmm. And the third one is more data driven. Mm -hmm. It's a third person perspective. So I always associate the artistic research with more of a first person perspective mm -hmm. where I don't have to step outside of the frame. That's the beauty of it. I just plunge in whatever feels right and the audience does the same thing. Um, so that's the way I look at it. And I don't mm -hmm. know if that's the answer, but as a designer, it would never be satisfactory for me to just stop there. I, see. I would have to step outside the frame and look at it from a couple of other that's actually a great point. Right. Um, like designers uh, seek uh, some sort of like universality in the value of the mm. design. Not necessarily, actually, not anymore. We don't mm. seek universality mm. um, because user personas are very different. Mm -hmm. We actually look at very specific mm -hmm. niches. If you, mm -hmm. you know, if you look at data, it's mm -hmm. it's, it's going to be um, segments. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but, segments. But if you look at more humanely, mm -hmm. that it is. Versus yeah. perhaps user persona. So universality is an old idea mm -hmm. that we don't mm -hmm. attempt to mm -hmm. follow it. But I don't know. That perspective is sort of like, you know, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. right, right. Artists <laughs> also kind of have to like step out of the box when when they want to make sure that this would work to other people. So do you think that that makes sense? That as an artist, did I misrepresent artists? Do they not have to, or do they want to step outside of the frame? Or are they satisfied to say, this is my question, that's what I want to experience? I think it is um, definitely an artist's responsibility to make their works communicatable mm -hmm. without like having to explain it. Without them. having to say yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So in that way, um, they definitely have to be aware of it. Like, they, they're free to maintain their own very peculiar and personal perspective on mm -hmm. something. That's the unique thing about mm -hmm. art, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, when, when they want to deliver that, that experience to the audience, if they're thinking about the audience, if that's not for <laughs> just himself, I think they have to step out of the, be able to have um, some distance view about what he's doing. Yeah, I was interested in the educational aspect. Um, I guess if you're working more so with uh, like formally trained researchers, there are a lot of structures in place where if you want to be a formal researcher, um, you have to identify your work within a specific field, you have to identify a specific audience for the final work, paper or book. Um, you have, there are a lot of structures about how to, like you have to explain every step. There are a lot of things you have to explain, a lot of things, structures you have to slot yourself into. I'm wondering how you go about 
um, taking someone with more training in that very formalized mm -hmm. process with rigid outcomes about what the final product will look like, mm -hmm. um, and your ability to explain every single choice you made, how you go from that to mm -hmm. a more open like sandbox. Right. Um, I like uh, starting uh, uh, with um, when I'm when I'm when I'm talking with my students from non-artistic background, um, but have very, very uh, like clear grasp of um, other methodologies in their respective fields. Um, I like to start with um, thinking about the epistemological gap um, or void that, um, that their, his, their methodology and their field cannot kind of probe or, or grasp. So, um, I think, um, for example, I mean, the like media anthropology kind of thing, visual anthropology, that's a very, very clear example and very classical example of, um, uh, of a similar attempt. But um, um, I think um, um, when it comes to other fields, I mean, they have all like different reasons for, for them to do that. So one, um, It's very hard actually because it's hard to explain. But um, when I'm uh, giving questions to my students, I let them to think about what the methodology, the existing methodology you've been working with, can do and what it cannot do, and what art can potentially do and what it cannot do. Obviously, art cannot um, like model. Art cannot model the black hole, for example. Right. But um, and also another thing is that, um, <laughs> and art is like very, very um, experiential thing. So you, you just have to make a lot of mock-up, make a lot of um, model, like, like physical um, setup to, to, to test your hypothesis. So it requires a lot of craft as well. But uh, what happens in the process of like uh, making stuff, like crafting stuff, you will end up discovering something else, your hypothesis was probably wrong, and the whole premise was probably wrong. And uh, through this material and manual experience, you discover something else, and you find a different way to, to tackle the, 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 the research questions. And another thing that I try to make sure is that, um, is to try to keep the, try to trace uh, the transformation of the initial research question when they start artist research. It changes a lot, but that, by like keeping the record of it and by kind of like reviewing it at the end, you kind of understand uh, how different methods, different language, different forms, different senses in your research can do different things and uh, how it can kind of um, result in a very different form of question and both the question and the result. And, and essentially, I, I consider um, when I'm teaching very advanced uh, research students uh, from non-artist background, I consider art, studio art, and artistic method as a foreign language. So art, art is a foreign language. That's kind of the the idea that I'm that I'm trying to get to when that when I'm when I'm trying to persuade my students to 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 not hurry. Because they need time for experience the uh, experience the material, the experiencing the material, and kind of be they have to be a master in their own way to deal with this material, whatever means uh, it can be. They have to kind of master. So um, I'm always kind of like making a metaphor of um, you're learning the Zulu language for the first time now. This term, you're like merely learning some some words and some like uh, letters. And uh, please accept that you won't be able to write a beautiful poem in Zulu at the end of this term. But you will start something very, very meaningful. So that's the kind of met metaphor that I want to, that I like to use to my students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, hi. <laughs> um, I really appreciate this because I'm definitely going through this process at the moment of trying to reconceptualize my work of research through art rather than journalism or media. 
Um, and so I definitely need to join your class, first of all, um, and learn how to do that. But I think um, in the back of my mind over the last few months of being in an academic institution rather than in media, I've been thinking, well, if the work that I'm doing is, is pretty much the same, if, if, it's, if, it's not, if it's not that different being in an academic context, I guess this would be the same with artists. Like what, what is the point of framing it? For artists? What's, what's the point of calling it research through art rather than just art? What is, mm -hmm. is there an advantage to the output mm -hmm. of the artists mm -hmm. and audiences? Mm -hmm. And then second, this is a, a selfish question for our team who are dealing with this at the moment, but how do you evaluate that? So mm -hmm. again, you've got the research question, you go about making your art, um, thinking about something that's so subjective, so kind of mm -hmm. um, difficult to, to yeah. judge um, compared to like metrics of how long songs go on, change policy. So what kind of methods mm -hmm. do you use in your own yeah, I, I mean, absolutely, those are all like super fiery questions um, these days in the art world. And um, to respond to the first question about um, what it means for artists to do research, um, I think it's um, it's actually very um, different depending on where you are. But for example, in European countries, um, um, they have to go through this uh, standardization process uh, in academia that was kind of like agreed on in uh, in sometime in the 90s so it's called Bologna process and uh, what they want to do is to kind of I mean European countries have like is, is EU is a very is a group of very diverse culture and systems so they kind of wanted to have this shared protocol for different forms of degrees, different forms of like um, accreditation and those kind of things. So um, they were like, they made the criteria for like what um, master, master degree in this country would be equivalent to what other degree in other like country that doesn't have master degree, for example. But um, so PhD in art, that's, that's how uh, it was developed in the European country. And um, so they wanted to kind of standardize it as well. So like artists now can have PhD, but they don't, they didn't know what it meant, what it meant at all. It was just a standardizing process uh, in relation to other disciplines. But anyway, uh, because of the change and shift in the system, um, uh, the funding uh, structure also changed as well. And the EU started funding artist research although they didn't know what that was. So there was some money. So they're trying to find ways to, uh, uh, to define artist research activity there for a very, very practical reason. But I think in, in the years, I think we are also, you're in a lot more um, exciting uh, uh, context actually, because it's, in the years, there's no money for artist research anyway. So uh, it's more about the epistemological challenge. So um, um, art, artists, um, there are so many already existing artists who uh, consider academia and research institution as, uh, as, a, as a background or the site for their artistic practice. But um, it was always, uh, but um, they, their artist practice was never recognized as a, as a form of knowledge production or whatsoever. But I think for artists, uh, what, is, what is more um, important to artists uh, who are kind of free from the European structure is that is to, is to, uh, is to be as nerdy as um, other researchers as well. They want to be recognized as a knowledge producer. And the second question, yeah, respond to, the, to respond to the, the question about the validity. That's actually a really, really uh, difficult uh, conversation, but um, um, people are debating about that. But the, the, and also there's a recently a uh, charter published uh, in European, in EU called uh, Advanced Practice, Charter for Advanced Practice. So they're kind of talking about how to validate, how, how to um, evaluate artistic research. Um, and uh, that have to be still, they're still working as a working group and uh, they're still in the process of um, making a um, consensus there. But, um, but 
but the one big premise is that it has to be between the people who are invested in this, who are invested in artist research, or whether they are coming from art world, whether they are coming from um, other disciplines, uh, when they're invested in artist research, they have to be the judges uh, themselves. So it has to be uh, um, um, basically peer review. And I'm very aware of that, um, the peer review process in uh, like, like the field, um, field of, in other fields, uh, is under scrutiny a lot. It's uh, you, you need to uh, kind of take it with a grain of salt. But um, the thing in the art world is that there has never been peer review system. Art, well, unofficially, unofficially, artists are evaluate, constantly evaluating their peer artists, but that never goes official. Official ranking, official evaluation, always, always is coming from uh, either art critique or art historian or um, theorists who have very, very different uh, value set and very different um, vision for what they're working on. So um, uh, I think um, by um, kind of establishing, establish, like having this framework of artist research can also provide artists and artist researchers uh, um, the, the opportunity and also the power and access to the evaluation process themselves too. I think that's, that's I don't know, I think that's, that's what excites me the most. Yes? Yes? Yeah. Hi, um, would it be okay if I ask two questions? Uh -huh. um, my first question is that for um, an alphabet for the notes, mm -hmm. it seems like a scholarly and also an artistic piece. Mm -hmm. And um, although the artist or um, the creator, you know, gives her own meaning to the art, mm -hmm. the audience can perceive it differently. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, if someone is fond of certain sense and is not fond of the same sense, mm -hmm. could the word be, what should I say, uh, could it affect the meaning to each mm -hmm. person? Mm -hmm. Because if the sense is positive or negative, I think it could mean differently mm -hmm. and, you know, Everyone has different you know, sensories and like sensitivities. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm curious what you think of that. Um, yeah, uh, that's also a very good question. I think, um, but that happens in every other artistic, like artistic presentation or research presentation. I feel you can disagree, basically. You can disagree, and you know, in order to rebut it, um, you have to show something else. You have to prove it in a way. So probably in in the case of art, you have to provide alternative experience to the audience too. So I think that's um, one uh, way to think about that. Yeah. Oh, there question two. Yeah, yeah um, for the second question, you talked about working with your students with um, visual art and also research. Um, I'm curious if you also work with auditory art because adding you know different sensory or elements mm -hmm. really change the project or give different meaning and yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I just uh, habitually said it was a visual art, but the visual art, like when people like say visual art, it's actually, I mean, weirdly, it actually refers to all kinds of art. So yeah, it includes all, all kinds of senses and I am uh, myself is a performance artist. So uh, I like uh, embracing all different kinds of senses and especially the tactile senses. Have you seen, um, so what do you think of sort of collaborations between people mm -hmm. of different fields mm -hmm. with artists? And mm -hmm. Is that something you engage in? Collaboration? Uh, you know, between an artist and a scientist. So you have a researcher, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. someone formally trained in a different field, oh, non-artist. That is, I think, uh, definitely, um, I mean, the matter, the question here is that um, to, to have a meaningful, really like meaningful and significant, uh, significant um, uh, outcome out of the collaboration, right? Rather than just attempting it and just like it's yeah, hard, right? right? It's very, very difficult, right? But yeah. um, I think it's very, very uh, possible. But the only problem is that everybody's so busy with their own agenda, and then also as a person, you have to build up trust, and they can time, they can, they can take time. So. Um, I've been asking very similar questions to 
like more uh, mature artists a lot of times these days, but um, their answers are like, it takes time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. He, and this specific, <laughs> yeah, it takes time. <laughs> and it may happen or it may not happen, but uh -huh. it takes time. And he, for example, he had to, for one, like, uh, like, um, one of his first projects, he had to wait, he had to spend like two and a half year to build a trust with the, with the specific scientist he wanted to work with, uh, who was at the Max Planck Institute in Germany. And then, but, the, but he had to be patient and he had to just work on his own yeah. practice. And then, and then finally, yeah. yeah, it flourished beautifully. Thank you so much.